Welcome to the Pomona Student Union's Sex and Sensibility. The Pomona Student Union is a student-run, nonpartisan organization dedicated to promoting honest and open dialogue at Pomona and in the broader Claremont community. We present speakers, debates, panels, and student discussions to provide forums that are inclusive of all points of view with the intent of challenging the assumptions of students and ourselves. To find out more about upcoming events or to join our mailing list, please visit our website, psu.pomona.edu. Now, if you could all take a moment to silence your cell phones, that would be much appreciated. Now, tonight we will examine sexuality and gender, looking at what factors influence sexuality and how our sexual desires translate into sexual orientations. My own interest in this topic began last year when I took a course here at Pomona on sexuality in ancient Greece. There, I was first introduced to an idea of social constructionism, which views sexuality as a set of practices that are made to conform to different models. These models of, society, of sexuality being constructed by societies throughout history. The other perspective that we were looking at in this class viewed sexual orientation as something fixed for each person and essential throughout history, hence the term essentialism. Um, now the point of this is that during this class and learning about these things, I asked myself, is society shaping our sexuality to fit an established model? Then where does this model come from in the first place? Are we inherently attracted to a certain sex or can we choose who we're attracted to? In short, what determines sexual orientation? Tonight, we hope to provide answers to some of those questions. We'll be looking at sexuality through several different lenses as we explore sexual desire and orientation. Our speakers tonight are Andrew Lear, Simon LeVay, Rachel Levin, and Pardis Madavi. Professor Lear is a cultural historian of ancient Greece. The history of gender and sexuality is one of his main areas. In particular, he works on the sources of evidence for ancient Greek pederasty, that is, the custom of erotic relations between adult men and adolescent males that was one of the hallmarks of Greek culture. He has published a book on the representation of this custom in Athenian vase painting, and a number of articles on the Greek lyric poet's self-representation as aristai, or lovers as boys, lovers of boys, excuse me. He taught here at Pomona from 2009 to 2011, and is now teaching at NYU. Dr. LeVay is a neuroscientist and author. He was educated in England and Germany, and he served on the faculties of Harvard Medical School and the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. He's best known for a 1991 report in which he described a difference in brain structure between gay and straight men. Dr. LeVay has written or co-authored 11 books on a wide variety of topics, his most recent being Gay, Straight, and the Reason Why, The Science of Sexual Orientation, published by Oxford University Press last year. He's also the author of a leading textbook of human sexuality, now in its fourth edition, and a New York Times bestseller titled When Science Goes Wrong, 12 Tales from the Dark Side of Discovery, which landed him on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. <laughs> Rachel Levin, PhD, is an associate professor in the biology and neuroscience departments at Pomona College. Her research looks at reproductive behavior and its underlying neuroendocrinological mechanisms in wild animals, ranging from chimps and baboons to duetting wrens and poison arrow frogs in Central American rainforests. Together with her students, she's currently conducting research on gender identity, sexuality, and navigation strategies in wild humans. She and her students have collected data from over 1,000 subjects of an array of gender identities and sexualities, and work that has been welcomed and supported by many national organizations and the LGBTQ community. Professor Levin has asked me to let you know that you too can be a data point, no matter what your identity or orientation. Simply contact her after the debate. <laughs> and Paris Madavi, PhD, is an associate professor of anthropology at Pomona College. Her research interests include gendered labor, migration, sexuality, human rights, youth culture, transnational feminism, and public health in the context of changing global and political structures. Her first book, Passionate Uprisings, Iran's Sexual Revolution, was published with Stanford University Press in 2008. And her second book, Gridlock, Labor, Migration, and Human Trafficking in Dubai, also Stanford University Press, is now available. Paris has published extensively in a variety of journals and teaches courses on medical anthropology, sociocultural anthropology, ethnographic methods, and has designed new courses entitled Sexual Politics of the Middle East and Love, Labor, and the Law. Please join me in welcoming our speakers.
Now, tonight I will ask our speakers three open-ended questions. Each speaker will have a chance to respond and discuss with each other, and then we will have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions at the end. So, let's start off with the big question. Where do sexual orientations come from? Why do different practices and identities arise? Does everyone have an essential biological drive towards being homosexual or heterosexual? Or is sexuality so amorphous that any categories we place on it are only the result of society determining what sexuality will look like? We'll begin with Professor Lear. Do you want to use this one? No, I think that. Uh, is that okay? Okay, so um, I, in order to, just to uh, answer this question, I think the first thing I need to do is introduce uh, what I work on because uh, my, work, my response will derive from my work. I'm a historian of uh, ancient Greece and I work to a large extent on Greek ideas about sexuality. Um, the Greeks viewed, ancient Greeks, viewed human sexuality very differently from us as, as you probably know, at least in some subliminal way. Um, we believe, broadly speaking, our culture believes that human beings each have a sexual identity. That is to say, each person desires either to have sex with people of his or her own sex or of the other sex. And then we, we can see that there's a category of people in the middle that's always a somewhat con uh, contested area. Um, the Greeks viewed sexuality in an entirely different way. First of all, they were only concerned with the sexuality of adult males, um, since those are really the only people that they considered an ethical subject. And so we only have their description of what adult males might have desired. Uh, and um, of course, our evidence is always a bit problematic because we have so little evidence from ancient Greece. And mostly they tell us what people should do and what they shouldn't do rather than what they do. Um, nonetheless, from this we can sort of derive a kind of Greek model of sexuality. And their view of adult men is that they are attracted to women and adolescent boys. These two groups, both entirely permitted sexual objects for a man, um, uh, which is, of course, in a very strong contrast to modern sexuality because also an age restriction on adult adolescent sex is a very important aspect of the way we review sexuality at the moment. So sort of polyvalent differences. Um, the part of this sexuality that they talk about the most and of which they thought the most highly was relations between adult men and adolescent boys, which they were tended to regard as educative in nature. Um, the, um, and to underline the difference between Greek and modern views, they did not approve of sexual relations between adult men. So same age, equal status, homosexual relations, which we now think are at least, or many Americans now think are an okay option, were not regarded as an okay option. Now, uh, I could go on also about ancient Rome, which I also study. Uh, and the Romans had a quite different view of sexuality from the Greeks, but they also tended to think of men as attracted both to women and adolescent boys. So at least by contrast to our view of sexuality, they held a similar view of what sexuality was about. So um, in fact, the study of sexuality in, the, in recent times started pretty much uh, with the study, with the study of ancient sexuality, because ancient sexuality raises a number of interesting questions about modern sexuality, and I want to put these in a slightly different way from which, from uh, the way in which they're usually put, which is, were the Greeks simply wrong? Uh, in other words, were they actually to be divided into homosexuals and heterosexuals, and they just didn't know what they were attracted to? Uh, because to uh, voice to back up an essentialist view of sexuality, that's how you have to view them. Right. You have to think that they weren't, ah, thank you. Uh, so um, I think, in fact, that a social constructionist perspective is something we would all accept so long as we were talking about antiquity. We would all agree that their sexuality was determined by their society. Now, what we don't believe is that our society is, it, our sexuality is determined by our society. Um, but of course, this is, uh, and we all think, many people think in any case, that they were born with the sexuality they have. Uh, and I want to tell you that the reason for that is we just don't remember being indoctrinated as children. Nobody remembers their father holding them in his arms and saying, you know, my little man. Uh, but, but it is where it all goes back to. So. Um, I see that I'm, I'm running out of time. This, as you may imagine, is a topic that I could talk on, uh, about for a long time. Um, but uh, all right, I, I think I'll leave it there, and we can go on and talk about other things later on. Okay. Um, can I ask you a question? The, um, you know, uh, 
There's the famous story in Plato's Symposium mm -hmm. where Aristophanes, or Plato puts into the mouth mm -hmm. of Aristophanes this myth or, or story about how, at least this, I mean, a plain reading of this story would be how, how is it that some people are attracted to other people of the same sex as themselves? And how, how is it that some other people are attracted to a sex different from themselves? And Aristophanes creates this sort of creation myth where he says, it all it's basically a genetic theory of, of sexual orientation. And then he says, it depends on who your ancestors were. And without getting into the details of the myth, the point is, in that story, there's an assumption that people know about the fact that there are differences between same, people who have same-sex attraction and people who have opposite-sex attraction. In fact, he has words to describe those people. He has this word, um, heteristria, which is, it, actually, it's a hapax legomenon, I think, right? right. But, 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 it's, uh, but from the context, it's clear that it means a woman who is sexually oriented towards other women. And, and now, so... Can I answer, because I see, I yes. see, we're done with so, your so question, you, I think. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, the, uh, you probably don't know what the term hapax legomenon means, by okay. the way, which is a, a, word, a term we use in classics to refer to a word that only occurs once. Uh, so we, we kind of make up its meaning out of context, usually, or perhaps from etymology. Um, the answer is that this entire speech is a hapax legomenon. It's yeah. the only text in all of Greek culture right. which voices that idea. And it is interesting in a way, uh, although I actually know of one vase painting, which also seems to imply some idea of the kind, although there we're speaking of a mute source, of course. Um, it's interesting that that idea can have been present in ancient culture and been taken up so little literally ignored everywhere else throughout ancient cultures that he ever said that. Um, of course, we also in our culture have other possible sexual ideologies. That is, we tend to think that people are all homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual. But you know perfectly well that somebody might say to you at lunch, oh, people are all bisexual anyway, right? It's not an idea that's absent from our culture. So other ideas are also present, but this is a very rare idea in, in classical antiquity. But, but again, I hate to stick with the symposium and everything, but mm. the, the um, you mentioned the fact that sexual relationships between adult men were not sanctioned, not, not mm -hmm. cool in, in mm -hmm. ancient Greece. But weren't the two men of that symposium, A Agathon and uh, Pausanias, mm -hmm. who did stay together for a long period of time? And it's true that Agathon, who I think was the maybe the more junior or perhaps more feminine member of that no, pair. Junior. He, was junior, mocked, substantially junior. he was mocked by in Aristophanes' okay. plays, wasn't he? And, and Aristophanes sort of portrayed him as being a sort of um, very feminine. And He's in here. It's one of the things I wanted to talk about, oh, okay, but I haven't sorry. got to. Okay. No, no, that's cool. So what I'm saying is that yeah. uh, maybe this wasn't talked about very much, mm -hmm. but there is some evidence that it existed. Of course. Even of course. So. And, and is it possible to say mm -hmm. that what's changed really between ancient Greece and now is not um, that you know, homosexuality has really changed, but it's, it's what people talk about, what people think about, how people socially construct it, yes. as you say, but not the basic sort of uh, desires and so on that people yeah. may have. Uh, it, it is possible because, of course, as many people know from their own experiences, as certainly uh, scientists know from their study, people's sexual behavior does not actually uh, uh, conform very well to sexual ideology. You know, people have done... Uh, if you think of your life, of your sexual life, as all the sexual activities you've actually engaged in in your entire life from birth to death, rather than those few, that those which you wish to emphasize in your view of yourself, then people have very often engaged in all kinds of sexual activities which they're just not regarding as central. And certainly in every society, there are all kinds of people who, who even tend to do things which are not the thing that society considers most appropriate. Mm. Um, it does seem that Pausanias and Agathon, who are of course a very interesting interesting case are uh, something of an exceptional case that is that they were they had a relationship between two adult men which was regarded as respectable at least by some by people, some people. Yeah. Um, an interesting thing about uh, no need to get into this in great detail but Agathon is made fun of in one of Aristophanes's comedies but he never mentions yeah. the relationship so right. he seems to be making fun of him for other things for his femininity I think right oh. for the fact that he wrote sympathetically about women in his tragedies I think okay. yeah Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Professor Levin? Oh. Well, <clears throat> I'm a little bit left in the dust, so I'm going to shift gears, <laughs> boys. <laughs> um, I think the question of whether there is such a biologically determined thing as homosexuality and heterosexuality, or if instead those are categories from a social construct, is an irrelevant question. Um, 
And I think it's a really good example of how we ask questions that are driven by our own needs and our own assumptions and our own motivations. So I guess what I would first say is why ask the question at all? Um, why do we need to label and categorize things? Um, a brief digression into medicine. If you go to a doctor in this country um, who's not in an HMO, they will spend a lot of time giving you tests and trying to diagnose and label what is wrong with you and after that figure out what to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, I have it on the greatest authority, my first cousin, who lives in France, who says that in fact the approach there, at least for her, with the same maladies from which I suffer, was very different. And they asked her how she felt and what her symptoms were and treated her by symptoms as an individual rather than placing a label on who she was. Mm -hmm. Now I think the analogy is sort of obvious. Um, would placing a label on someone cause you to treat them differently or cause you to vote differently or cause you to legislate differently? And why should it? So that said, um, one of your original questions, Daniel, I think was assuming that if sexuality was an amorphous, spongy, non-binary thing, it must be a social construct. At least one of the things that you sent me implied that. And I wanted to address that because in my belief and what some of the work that I've been doing shows, or suggests at least, is that sexuality is not binary. So if you can imagine an array or a constellation of spectra. Um, and you can place yourself somewhere in that starry sky. And then we ask five or six people from the audience to come up and draw shapes around different clusters that they feel are define something. Is who your star is and who you identify as going to be any different depending on whether Simon puts you in group A or Pardis puts you in group six? Absolutely not. You are who you are, regardless of what your label is. So one of the last things I want to say is that most data from science show that sexuality is not binary. Kinsey saw this in the 1940s and 50s when he asked a bunch of people to score themselves in confidentiality and anonymously on a scale from zero, which I think was straight, yes. to seven or six, six. which was gay. Um, the data were analyzed and the big shocker was that there were many fewer zeros, straight people, than what we see on the street. And there were many fewer gay people than what we see on the street. Um, in our project of over a thousand people, if we just isolate those who are um, cisgender, that is, for example, male-born, male-identifying people, and female-born, female-identifying people, um, roughly 10% of those people identify as completely gay or completely straight. 10% gay, 10% straight, straight, irregardless of their gender identity. Um, the rest of them um, are somewhere in the middle. So when we, science does a really funny thing. Um, most scientists, when looking at some sort of issue, look at the extremes first because it's really easy. You want to know if something is there. Um, so you look at the very gay people and the very straight people. The problem here is that you're drawing conclusions on a subset, not the majority, and you're facing, placing people into a false binary. The final thing I want to say is to challenge the, the definitions of gay and straight. Who gets to be gay and who gets to be straight? Is it what you do and who you do it with? Is it who you think about doing with it, unencumbered by opportunity or social constraint? Um, is it who you socially bond to? Um, and in our data set, depending on which analysis or which definition we take, at least our preliminary analyses say that you get very different results depending on how you define sexuality. So the bottom line I'd like to say is that it's an irrelevant question. It doesn't matter if it's a choice. It doesn't matter if it's a social construct. Um, and that sexuality is not binary. Just for starters, just saying. Can I, can I actually uh, make a sort of comment such question, which is it does matter because in fact it influences what people do well, we'll and also what they desire. Yeah. yeah. So it does matter. So I think we need to ask why we're asking the question, which yeah. is more important than where your identity or sexuality comes from. 
Um, it's great going after Professor Levin because she made a lot of the points I wanted to make. So that works out well. Um, I guess from an anthropological perspective, um, the first part of the question, I believe, was if sexuality is constructed by society or culture, why do different practices and identities arise? And I guess the anthropologist in me would say, well, because cultures are different, societies are different, everything is fluid, um, things change across time and space. Obviously, you've heard that a little bit. But I want to kind of speak to the point of, of it, sexuality not being being binary. I think that this is something I found in my research. Um, briefly, I do research on sexual, sexuality and sexual politics in the Middle East. Um, and I remember asking my interlocutors, um, you know, I would say, well, you know, do, do you identify as, you know, hetero or homo? And they would say, that is so American of you to even ask such a question. It's so American of you to want to put me in a box. Why would I have to check a box, right? I, you know, I have very close friends of the same gender and I have, you know, same gender love and sometimes I engage in sexual relations with them. Uh, I might be married to a man, I might be married to a woman, but I don't put myself in a category and I, and they, they would say that they were very frustrated with this Western um, desire to categorize and to script people, right? Um, which is where, of course, you know, you then have categories like MSM and WSW, all these other categories popping up because our language is very inadequate. Um, you know, the second part of the question had to do with does everyone have an essential biological drive towards being homosexual, heterosexual? I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of, you know, taken aback by the biological aspect, right? Because biology, look, we have three categories, for lack of a better word. You have sex, you have gender, you have sexuality. Knowing one of them tells you nothing about the other. Knowing somebody's sex tells you nothing about their gender or their sexuality. Knowing somebody's sexuality tells you nothing about their gender or their sex. Biology will tell you a little bit about their sex. It tells you nothing about their gender or their sexuality, right? And so that's where I think it gets a little bit tricky, right? Um, and I think, you know, uh, a lot of the points uh, have obviously been made and I, I want to engage in conversation, but I, I just want to um, quote a very a good friend of mine who does a, a lot of research uh, in this area and in the Middle East, and, and this is kind of a rough translation, but she basically said that, look, people aren't born wanting to be in the leather scene any more than they're born wanting Coca-Cola in particular. And so, you know, this kind of goes to the fact that obviously, you know, all kinds of things factor into to sexuality and, and you can't put people in, people are different. You are your own person. People are different. And um, when we try to put people in categories and boxes, um, it, it, it kind of makes me nervous um, because it reminds me of moral panics. It reminds me of the moral panics that colored um, all of the crimes that went on uh, in the 20s and the 30s where you know women in particular were taken and were locked up and were given um, shock therapy for, for having you know too, too much of libido, too sexually loose. Um, and, and, and lewd behavior was just as defined by, by law enforcement. And so I worry about categorization. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, regards to uh, cultural pressures on sexuality. So how do people respond to these cultural pressures? Uh, when people respond negatively to what's perceived as normal or standard, are they following intuitive desires or are they rebelling against the norm? In other words, if sexuality is constructed by culture, then how are, is culture working on us when it comes to sexuality? And we'll begin with Professor Madavi. All right, I, guess, I mean, I guess I have to, again, beg the, what is normal, right? What is standard? And, you know, cultures, there are subcultures, there are sub-subcultures, and, and, and it, it's different, right? Um, but I guess I could, I could talk a little bit about you know, the, the case of Iran. I could draw my Iran research. Um, I think that in Iran, people respond negatively to the government pressures. And I want to make a distinction that it's not cultural, but that it's governmental. Um, and so in Iran, you have a case where the government is very vested in um, operationalizing its power through a fabric of morality. And so young people, um, in an attempt to sort of shake and dislodge that regime are using their bodies, using their sexualities to speak back because that's been defined as the battleground for this regime. And so you have young people 
um, engaging in what they call a sexual revolution. Uh, and that's that's partly to speak back to the government, but it's also kind of, you know, um, drawing on the language that was articulated with the sexual revolution in this country, where people just wanted to open up a space to have different types of conversations about sexuality. And so, um, you know, do people rebel against the norm, or do people rebel against cultural pressures? Yeah, but not, I mean, sexuality is not the only realm in which they do that, right? I mean, those of you who are in my medical anthropology class, what did we talk about today? We talked about binge drinking, right? And how the more you tell people, you know, not to do something, or the more you try to restrict it, obviously the more people kind of abuse that. And so Foucault's repressive hypothesis applies to things beyond sexuality. Uh, so anytime there are stringent pressures, people kind of, uh, I had an interlocutor um, who was a sex worker in Dubai, and she said, anytime you close the door, people are going to go out the window. Um, so, you know, that, that's, that's not only with regards to, to sexuality, but, um, you know, it, I guess people might respond negatively, but again, I don't really know. It, it would presuppose an accepted mainstream definition of the norm. And since that's in flux and since that's different across time, across space, across culture, it, you, I don't think it's very easy to define the, the norm. Professor Lear? Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, here, as a classicist, I have an evidentiary problem, which is that in ancient Greece, we have a lot of evidence for people who were spoken of ill in terms of their sexuality, but we have no evidence for anyone who's thought, who expressed themselves as having a sexuality different from society's norms. There were attempts to redefine society's norms, but uh, the perspective was always one of adhering to society's norms. This may change a little bit in Rome, where some of you may know the poet Catullus, who represents himself as having affairs with a married woman and an elite boy. And these are the two categories of people that a Roman couldn't legitimately have affairs with. So it, it may be part of a bad boy persona that he's, he's sort of showing off that he's having uh, sexual, his, that his sexuality is not what's approved of. Um, it's a little hard to say. In any case, as a scholar of the ancient world, I don't have a lot to say about this because counter uh, cultural sexualities are not such a function in the ancient world. Uh, actually, I could talk about it a little by changing hats and talking about world history, which is one of the other things I work on. Um, and uh, the idea of having uh, an identity based around a sexuality seems to me to be something that starts in the 18th century in the West. And I, I therefore am prone, uh, I, I hope people won't find this offensive, to view it um, as um, connected to the rise of nationalisms and to the rise of well, what a friend of mine as a world historian refers to as the age of isms. It's in, from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century, people are very prone to construct identities for themselves along national and ideological lines. Um, within the United States, we start doing this uh, in the 20th century in terms of ethnic lines. And I think that the idea of sexuality, uh, in other words, it's not a rebellion against society, but rather a search for an identity. It has to do with a modern attempt to construct for each individual an identity in which you um, sort of construct yourself according to various points within the society that you um, are in connection with. And I, I tend to think that sexuality has more of a connection to that. Pardis, I'm kind of mystified by when you said that there's no connection between sex and gender. I mean, I, I, we, we may not be on the same wavelength in terms of what we mean by gender, but I understand by gender to be the whole sort of constellation of psychological and behavioral traits that differ on average between men and women. So that if you, you know, measure something like you know, ch ch children's toy, toy preference, something, a gender trait, it differs on average between boys and girls. So there's, there's just almost by definition, there's a correlation between sex and gender. So what is it, when you say there's, there's no connection, what does that mean? I don't understand. Okay, am I allowed to answer yeah, now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, right, okay, sorry. I, 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 I yield um, yes, the floor. Sorry, yeah, no. Um, I guess I, it's the idea that, you know, gender is, is what you, you choose, is the pronoun that you choose to be referred to as, right? And so what you're born as may not be what you identify as. Okay. Um, gender is also what you perform. Gender changes. So if I walked in here wearing pants 
um, 50, 60, 60 years ago, you wouldn't, I, that wouldn't be my gender identity. Okay. And that, I would be then performing gender male, right? Okay. It, it, to it. an extent. Um, and, and of course, even if you go back to, you know, if you go to the this idea of sort of children, I mean, I have a daughter, she's one, but she prefers playing with trucks, mm -hmm. but she's, you know, so what she's performing, you know, so, so gender is what you're performing, sex is maybe what you're Well, you said something like gender is what you choose to do or something. Now, that, that's, that's where I definitely take issue with you because, um, or um, maybe I shouldn't say I take issue with. I just have a different concept of what gender is. Okay. I mean, I, I think I think of gender, as, as I said before, simply being the collection, the whole collection of behavioral or psychological traits that tend to differ on average between males and females. So, and many of these traits are clearly under some sort of biological influence, including sexual orientation. I mean, I'm not going to talk about my own research, or, or you, know, you should invite me back, and I'll give you a whole presentation uh, uh, on that topic. But this overwhelming evidence at this point that there are biological influences not only on sexual orientation but on many different what I call gender traits but you'd probably exclude them such as children's toy preference right, but which which not only you see it differing between boys and girls at a very young age on average but also you see it, it, same differences between male and female animals for example you know toy preferences of male and female monkeys mimic to an extraordinary degree the toy preferences of boys and girls even though monkeys have never seen these toys before so th there really is evidence that there's something deeper going on that's nothing to do with choosing stuff or, or being taught by parents to behave in a certain way there's some sort of something comes from within people that seems to be echoed even between, between, bless you, bless you, between species. But how would, am I allowed to keep? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know the, the rules of engagement here. Um, but what about, you know, tr trans? I mean, how, how, then how would you? Well, it, it's, an, it, no one really understands fully the origins of, of, of gender identity in terms of uh, transgendered people, how, how people come to be transgendered. What is known is that there are significant differences in brain organization between those people who become transgendered and those who don't, suggesting some sort of biological origin. And um, there's uh, other ways uh, that, that uh, some evidence of transsexuality runs in families, for example, which could, could support the idea that there are genes operating in certain families that are influencing them to be transgendered. Um, and uh, the correlations between being, being transgender in terms of who, what sex you, th you think you are or want to be uh, with other aspects of, um, of gender such as um, toy preference for example uh, so ch you know childhood behaviors so um, I would not at all dismiss the idea that gender identity is uh, also under strong biological influence. But uh, do but I have any more time or am I? I've got but it one varies minute. across culture. Okay. Can I, I'm sorry, I, 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 can I just back up to what um, Rachel was saying, um, this matter of um, whether sexual orientation is a dichotomy, gay versus straight or not. That's a really important issue and I, I think most of the evidence points to the, to the conclusion that sexual orientation is much more dichotomous in men than it is in women. And there are many studies showing you know, a U-shaped or bimodal distribution of sexual orientation in men where you see a lot of heterosexual men, a few gay men, and not so many bisexual men. Whereas in women, you don't see that. You see a sort of a J shape, uh, a sort of flattened curve where there are actually more bisexually identified women than, than out and out lesbians. And I think that's a basic sex difference that whose basis is not really understood at this point. Thank you. Uh, Professor Levin? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> So much to say in so little time. Um, just to reflect back on um, what Dr. LeVay was saying, so much of what he was saying, um, there are differences between men and women in their sexuality, <laughs> but I believe that they are much less pronounced than people think they are or than scientific data would suggest that they are because I think it depends on how you ask the question. Um, and. Our data, for example, suggest that there are similar numbers, especially in our generation, of the number of men, male identified and female identified people who um, consider themselves gay or straight. The differences become in the younger generation, you guys. You guys are totally messing up my database when I want to compare it to everybody else's. And that's where we see the difference between men and women in the under 40 set, um, where women have are twice as much, twice 
more likely to identify as something other than simply gay or straight, that is a Kinsey zero or a Kinsey six. Um, that said, I'd like to go back to what Pardis was talking about. I strongly believe that gender identity, gender performance, sexuality, and sex are distinctly different things. They may have different etiologies and different origins. They may tend to correlate in many of us, so that someone who is male-born may be more likely to identify as male, um, their performance may be, may, might like trucks, if you consider that a gendered trait, I'm male, but at least I'm performing male. Well, uh, whatever, they are very, very distinct things, and they often tend to correlate, but they often don't. Um, as reflects biology of things like gender identity or sexuality, all that we have are correlations. There, so far, is no substantial proof or cause and effect so I'd like you all to walk out of here saying correlation is not causation. Finding that men do something or women do something else or that they correlate with sex, gender identity, or sexuality does not a cause and effect relationship. Um, let's see, what else do I get to say in all this? I wanted to, how much time do I have left? Oh, cool, okay. Um, <laughs> I'd like you all to take a minute and think about whether you are right-handed or left-handed. Everybody who's right-handed, raise your hand really quick. You can't think about it? Okay, all the lefties. Oh, you are in a handedness minority. I'm really sorry, and you're really different. Um, <laughs> However, um, my father's generation um, would say that you can undergo reparation therapy, and you can be fixed, and you can be made right-handed, um, at least in public, in the public schools, you can be. Now, interestingly enough, teachers in the current generation don't repair lefties like you. Um, we embrace your diversity, and we embrace handedness diversity. How many of you are neither right-handed or left-handed? Okay, well that's pretty cool. Um, so the point here being that if we learn from something as simple as handedness, there is a very different change in attitude between my dad's generation, he was fixed, and my generation, I was not, but I'm right-handed, so there you have it. Um, <laughs> nobody asked my dad if it was a choice, whether he was right-handed or left-handed, but for those of you who are righties, try writing with your left hand, and be asked if that ask yourself if that feels normal. Ask yourself if you chose to be right-handed or left-handed. Um, so my hope is that in a generation from now, these are all non-issues and we don't struggle with them as much. Um, finally, um, I'll wait and go into my next little answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for our final question, uh, Professor Levin brought up the idea of why questioning the question in a sense, why do we talk about these things? And that's what we're going to turn to now. Popular culture is currently convinced of an essentialist view of sexuality. In academia, however, social constructionism is the prevailing view. Is this debate between these two viewpoints an academic struggle to understand sexuality, or are there bigger political and cultural reasons for defending a certain stance or a certain way of viewing this topic? Professor Levin, we'll begin with you again. Okay, um, many people in this room characterize um, society as viewing that sexuality is innate and academia, academia as viewing that it's a social construct. And first of all, I'd like to say that's an inaccurate representation, um, which was written in one copy of the question that I got. Um, in the beginnings of my of the few first few weeks of my class of gender identity and power and biology, and I'm glad to see a number of alums in the room, um, I asked the students, um, how do you define gender identity and where does it come from? And almost to a one, anyone from the humanities or social sciences says it's a social construct, and anyone who's had a biology class says it's biologically determined by prenatal hormones, of course. And, um, and then it goes downhill or uphill from there. <laughs> so, um, both views are um, clearly represented in um, academia. And I think that we're living at a very dangerous moment in society. Um, we're in a perfect storm headed towards biological determinism. We're in an era where people have sequenced the human genome and Anderson Cooper and all those other little talking heads in the news talk about a gene for this and a gene for that. Um, so what will happen if we ever, God forbid, discover a gay gene or a trans gene? Um, what does that mean? Um, 
Well, it means maybe you are more or less predisposed to be trans or gay, but does it mean that you're going to be trans or gay? And what are we going to do with that information? Um, are we going to test everybody? And those of you out there who have the gay gene, you get to be gay, and you get to get married, and we're going to legislate that that's okay. But if you don't have the gay gene, are you any less gay? Um, in other words, we're, putting, we're in a position where we're putting, giving science power and science the authority to determine whether being gay or straight, trans or cis, um, is valid or legitimate. And I think that is a very, very dangerous precedent to set. Um, as a case in point, um, Simon LeVay here, who has, um, is not telling his own story. I'd like to share, for those of you who are younger in the crowd, what happened in 1991 when his paper came out. So Simon looked at the brains of um, dead, gay, and straight men, and straight women, right? And uh, women whose sexual women, orientation wasn't known. Right, unknown. OK, the first response that many people had in the news was to ask whether Simon LeVay was gay. That is an insult. First of all, it's an insult to Simon as a scientist. Does that mean that he does biased science, seeking to further his own agenda as suggested by the news? Um, does that mean that my friend who looks at molecular mechanisms of memory is obsessed with a certain answer for personal reasons? It's completely irrelevant. The second thing that everybody did was to discredit LaVey's science. Um, you never claimed, to my knowledge, that you had an unbiased or anything data set. You inherited and got lucky access to a set of brains. Now, it turned out that most, if not all, of the brains of the gay men were people who had died of AIDS. So is what we're looking at the result of AIDS or homosexuality? Is homosexuality a cause or an effect? Correlation is not causation. The point is, it was a brave and broad and fantastic first step into an inquiry. Um, so my point here is, why do we ask the question, what are we going to do with the information? Some of you may be too young to know about the publication of The Bell Curve, a book that came out in 1994 by two highly lauded, highly respected professors from Harvard. The book was this thick. It had over 300 graphs with figures and arrows, so it must have been true. What they said was that um, intelligence, as measured by IQ tests, which we all know measure intelligence, um, <laughs> is hereditary and that different races and ethnic groups had different levels of intelligence. Why ask the question as to whether you gay, being gay is a choice or not? What are you going to do with that information? What Hernstein and Murray suggested in the last two chapters of their book that you should do with information about intelligence was you should place people in separate groups and separate neighborhoods. Um, that you should limit the rights and abilities of those who were cognitively challenged because they were not intelligent enough to understand whether they should or could have sex before marriage. Some people should be sterilized. Some people should be told they couldn't lose their virginity until they were married. I think it's a very, very very dangerous world that we live in, and that we all understand that it's both nature and nurture that determines who we are, make no doubt about it. Professor Madavi? I should just say what she said. <laughs> <laughs> like, ditto, end of conversation. No, um, I just want, I mean, I just want to, I guess, echo what Professor Levin said, you know, I, I think that um, I've also had the same experience in academia where you, ha you do have both sides of the debate in academia and people do get quite heated. And also, I would say in pop culture, you also have both sides. So you do have the social constructionist view represented, at least in some uh, examples of pop culture. I mean, I'd like to hear more from you which pop culture uh, you know, references your, you guys had in mind, but I think about, you know, a place like Iran, which, you know, there are, I can't tell you the number of films and documentaries about, you know, transgender, transsexuality, about, um, just about social constructionism, about how people, you know, are kind of challenging gender norms, people are challenging gender, you know, and, and these are, these are entering the mainstream, they're, um, they're viewed quite, quite frequently, and so I think that just as you have both present in academia, you have both present in pop culture, it's just which ones are privileged at what time and, and in what ways, um, so that's, that's, I, I think, one piece of the puzzle, but um, is this an important conversation to have. It's an unfortunate 
conversation that we have to be having, right? Because if because we are in an age where biological determinism does threaten us, right? And um, more than that, because we're in an age where um, sexuality continues to cause people discomfort, it continues to undergird a lot of legislation. Um, I think about the work that I spend most of my time doing, which is on trafficking, and how frustrated I am with the fact that trafficking is synonymous with sex trafficking, when 98% of the persons I met who had been abused or forced or exploited were not in the sex industry at all, were domestic workers, were construction workers, were people in all kinds of industries, and a vast majority of the people I met in the sex industry were just saying, leave me alone. I don't, I am not a victim. I do not want the police to raid us and rape us and, you know, beat us in jail. And so sexuality does play a role in a lot of legislation. It plays a, a big role in a lot of, you know, conversations we have in politics. So we do, we are in an era of sexual politics, whether we like it or not. So we do have to have the conversation as unfortunate as it is. Um, but I think we need to recognize that we need to start having a more robust conversation, right? That we, I mean, and we need to move beyond, is it, is it a choice? Is being gay or straight a choice? Is, the, is it a binary? I think that there are many more interesting things we can talk about. And um, I'm, I, I'm very hopeful because, you know, what I love about teaching here at Pomona is that you guys are having some of those really interesting conversations. At least you are in my classrooms. And so I'm hopeful that the next generation will move beyond, I think, this obsession with, um, is it, you know, nature or nurture? Professor Lear? Oh. Um, I want to just say one thing about um, a discussion everybody's been having on the stage. Uh, we're dividing the object of research into four categories, identity, gender, sexuality, and sex. But I think actually the, the subject sexuality itself is a much more complicated uh, object uh, because it itself, it seems to me, needs to be divided into at least three categories, which is desires um, and sex acts and what people say. Uh, all, all which are all three very different layers. Uh, desires, as we know, are perhaps somewhat incohate and hard to define, and people have all kinds of desires which they may or may not act on, may or may not wish to acknowledge. Uh, sex acts, uh, needless to say, are, are already a very complicated group of things. And then we move into what people say. And I'll tell you something I know about what people say about sex, which is they lie. <laughs> all the time. There is no topic that people lie about more. And this makes, uh, it, it is in fact, you know, the world's favorite favorite topic for lying. And therefore, um, doing research about sexuality is a very diff difficult thing to do because I, mean, I don't have to do this in dealing with the ancient world because I'm dealing only with fiction. You know, what people say about themselves in a kind of public way. But we, because we have a broader um, uh, set of data, that is the people are actually here, we can try to get past what they say about themselves to down to what they actually did or what they actually desire. But I don't think we can very often do that. Um, because in fact, I think everything people say about sexuality, even to Kinsey, is mostly lies. Um, and they're always leaving things out and trying to, because all people do all the time is try to present themselves as who they want to be. Right? And so they're presenting uh, various different fictions about themselves to various different people at different times, including to themselves. And so what object for research is here? Uh, in a way, I, I'm happy I work on the ancient world since I only have fiction. It's much easier to deal with. Um, so uh, I, I just want to say something uh, uh, then to Dan's question, which is I do think that in popular culture, at least in the United States, essentialism is enormously important. It's enormously important both in the gay world and in the general society, and I think there are, in fact, political reasons for it. Um, essentialism reigns in pop culture because the division between heterosexuality and homosexuality inherently sequesters those who don't adhere to society's basic norm into a separate group where they're easier to keep apart. And um, heterosexuality is, after all, mostly in society still an ideology rather than a fact. It's a set of prescriptive norms. Uh, just as being normal was before we really invented the idea of heterosexuality. Um, and um, homosexuality also serves for those who are, uh, you know, feel themselves strongly, those who feel they were born that way, who have a very high percentage of their desires are for people of their own sex. Homosexuality serves as a kind of group identity and gives them a kind of reassurance, a community, and so on and so forth. The problem is, and this is the problem with any kind of categorization or ideology, is that it 
impacts also those, uh, which Rachel just quantified as 80% uh, of people who are somewhere in between. And I was pointing out to Dan that I had just making notes to myself and said, those I take to be 60%. Uh, so I'll, I'll raise it to 80 for you, Rachel. Don't worry. I'll, and um, I just want to uh, tell you a little story that I raised at a faculty meeting last year, which was, this is a theoretical story. I'm not talking about anyone, which is uh, we were talking a lot about gay students and the problems with gay students. And I said, so what do we do about the boy who this weekend, when he was out camping, slept with his roommate? And now, like, he's really confused. Um, and I think the problem with the concepts homosexual and heterosexual, and it's very much a problem that impacts adolescents uh, because they're at an experimental phase of life and therefore maybe doing all kinds of things, is it forces them to think about what category they're in and it causes an enormous amount of suffering. Um, for people, let's just hope that boy doesn't commit suicide, right? Um, and it also causes suffering for his roommate, and it's all a lot of problem for everyone. So that's the problem with these categories, is that they are, in fact, enforced. And they also cause people to police themselves tremendously. Uh, if I can just have one more second, I want to say that until it, if I ever recommend a book to a large group of people, I'll recommend George Chauncey's Gay New York to you all, which is a lovely study of sort of homosexualities in the plural in New York from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. And Chauncey's basic idea is that in, before the spread of, psycho, of the psychiatric perspective in, the, in society, people were more divided and were not divided into homosexual and heterosexual in their minds, but into normal and fairies. Fairies were people who diverged from the norm both in gender and in terms of sexuality. And normal were guys who behaved like guys. But those guys actually slept with a fairly large variety of people, so long as they maintained their male behavior, male behavior, and their sex role. That is to say, as my students know, I have said on entirely other topics, so long as they were doing the ramen. Um, <laughs> It was about battleships uh, the first time I said it. <laughs> Did get misquoted many times, however. Um, so, um, where am I? Um, <laughs> the, the problem is that heterosexuality in our society is really just the same thing as normal, um, uh, only it's much more prescriptive because that guy in 1940 was normal so long as he behaved like a man and so long as he, he kept a certain role sexually, whereas now, from a very early childhood, boys are taught that they have to police their own sexuality. They're not allowed to desire sex with another male or sleep with another male. And that's a much harder line much harder, faster line. And that's, for many, many people, uh, at different moments in their lives, hopefully you know, a little problem, but also often a big problem. And it's, and it's all a problem enforced by these categories. Um, and that's I, usually when I talk at places, I um, have a PowerPoint presentation full of data slides. And uh, Daniel s sent me an email saying, no PowerPoint. And th scientists are very, um, get very nervous when they're separated from their data slides um, because um, we're trained not to believe anyone unless they show you numerical data bolstering what they say. So I uh, urge you to invite me back on another occasion. <laughs> And to t so I could t go through the evidence that I believe supports the idea that there's a very strong biological underpinning for, for um, uh, which influences uh, a predisposition to experience same-sex or opposite-sex attraction. I think the evidence for that now is overwhelming from many different uh, disciplines. Uh, so you could invite me back, or you could buy my book, which also uh, uh, is full of uh, numerical data, um, one of the same thing. So I'm not going to talk about that, although I will pick up, uh, since um, Rachel uh, talked a bit about my experiment and dropped in a little poison pill about uh, the fact that my gay subjects died of AIDS, and I can't leave that unanswered. Um, it, it's very clear from my study and from subsequent studies, such as the one by William Byne at um, Mount Sinai uh, Medical School, uh, that, that, that the fact that the men died of AIDS has nothing to do with their sexual orientation, with um, the, the size of the structure in the hypothalamus. And in fact, there was more recently a study on sheep, where, which is a species, which if, if you do invite me back, I'll show a videotape of gay sheep doing their thing. Um, <laughs> uh, 
in their brains, you see exactly the same, or very much nearly exactly the same as what I uh, found in the brains of the gay and straight men. And these are sheep who were completely healthy until they were sacrificed in, in the name of science. So, um, so I think there's plenty of evidence that the, the, what I saw was not a, a disease effect, if you like, in the way that uh, Rachel was uh, referring to. Now, there's plenty of other things that I don't agree with here that have been said. I don't agree, for example, with Daniel's um, statement here, the premise that um, in academia, social constructionism is, is, is the prevailing view. Now, that may be true in the humanities, I don't know, but the humanities is only a small part of academia, and um, that may be a bit surprising here at a liberal arts college, but that's the fact. And outside of, <laughs> outside of, the, outside of the humanities, with a few honorable exceptions, such as Rachel here, um, no one has heard of or cares about social constructionism. So it, it's just not a concept that people think about, sort of by and large, outside the humanities. Um, now, social oh, social science. Social science. Well, okay. And, um, <laughs> there's a but, whole but, other division here. What do you think? Social science, where there's I a whole said, other division. I just, I just said that. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what do you think? But it's not just humanities or hard sciences. There's a whole other division called the social sciences. Yeah, I, I didn't. Um, I know we're not real scientists. I did not. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't put uh, pose, uh, oppose humanities versus sciences. It had humanities versus the rest of academia, and the rest of academia, by, by and large, is sciences. I mean, numerically, most most academics who are not in humanities or scientists. And certainly if you go to any UC campus, you'll, you'll realize that's the case. And most people in those fields have never heard of social constructionism and don't care about it. So now, with, with regard to what I think about social constructionism, I think that, first of all, I don't have a lot of information about it. But as I understand it, there's, there are different kinds of social constructionism. There's a kind of strong or extreme form of social constructionism represented by people like David Halperin at uh, University of Michigan, who would say that um, before the word homosexuality was invented, there was no such thing as homosexuality, because you have to have the word to have the thing. And to me, that's about as idiotic as to saying that before there were blood groups that were, 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 had been discovered in the mid 20th century, there was no such thing as blood groups. I mean, that, that, that's I put that on about the same level as, of intellectual um, competence, if you like. Uh, so, but if you disregard that extreme form of social constructionism, I don't think there's any conflict between a biological perspective and a social constructionist perspective on sexuality. You know, I think there's a biological predisposition uh, towards a certain uh, towards sexual feelings that comes from uh, prenatal processes involving sex hormones, genes, and the developing brain, and the way that then plays out as you grow up is tremendously influenced by how society, uh, you know, imposes itself on you. There's no question about it, and that's very interesting and important. It's just people coming at this from different. I have to be a biologist. I'm interested in those underlying processes. Obviously, many of you people are interested in it from other perspectives. There's not a conflict. Thank you. Okay. I mean, no, we haven't done This concludes the formal section of tonight's panel. Could we please have another round of applause for tonight's speakers? We will now be taking student questions from the audience. If you have a question, please approach the mic in the center of the stage and ask whatever you want. <laughs> all right, so um, I just wanted to ask, perhaps from all your perspectives, perhaps from some of your perspectives, is this not working? Okay, I wanted to ask how um, ex-gay therapy and the sort of work of Exodus International how that plays into each of your approaches to sexuality. Um, I, I remember, sorry, I don't recall your name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, well. No, I was just asking your name. <laughs> what? Your name? Your name. Uh, Le Rachel Levin. Okay, well, I remember Dr. Levin um, was talking about handedness, and that also reminded me of, um, of the fact that, uh, that Within Chinese culture, it's still very common to, you know, indoctrinate away left-handedness. And I know um, many people who, who uh, were born left-handed and they were trained um, to write to write right-handed. So, um, 
I saw a parallel between these two, uh, between those two. So I'm particularly interested in your perspective on this. Um, how does how does ex gay therapy and whatever your understanding of its effectiveness and whatever data we have on it play into your understanding of sexuality from either of these perspectives or from both? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to make it clear that I'm not a social constructionist. Um, I just think that people are giving too much power to science, and I think. I love being a scientist and being able to say that. Um, that said, um, there are gazillions of correlations between being gay um, and various biological constructs, prenatal hormone levels, whatever you want to, I mean, so I think we cannot ignore those correlations because there's a million of them, but they are simply correlations. That said, um, reparation therapy, in my view, does not work. Um, I think we are who we are, and I hope nobody can talk you out of that. Um, the, the bit that I've looked into reparation therapy, it's ill-fated. Um, the American Psychological Association recommends against it, says it is ill-effective and it's abuse, and that's my opinion on it. Can I say I I think your choice of the phrase ex-gay therapy is great. I'm all in favor of therapy for ex-gays. I think they need help coming to terms with their <laughs> homosexuality. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, uh, I actually, uh, I am a social constructionist, <laughs> and infamously so, in fact. Uh, I was um, Camille Paglia said that I was more Foucauldian than Foucault, so I feel I could hardly be more of a social constructionist than that. Of course, she had misunderstood everything I said, but that's okay. Um, you know, if, if I could, if people, if people on the other side of the stage were saying your, your gender is the gender you pick, but it's also, of course, frequently your gender is the gender people assign to you, arguably, as well. Yeah. S similarly, I have been assigned the role of being a social constructionist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So um, I want to say that I actually have a lot of questions about both the categories, heterosexual and homosexual, but the two are very different uh, sets of questions. I think that heterosexuality is a default option and that it covers a host of sins. Uh, many people call themselves heterosexual, but their sexualities could be anything. Um, within the category of homosexual, on the other hand, my problem with the category is that it seems to me not necessarily one category. I'm very doubtful that homosexuals are all in any specific group. That is to say, I regard homosexuality as a reification of a prescription. You're not allowed to sleep with people, have sex with people of the same sex, therefore all people who have sex with people of the same sex are in a group. But where does that group come from? It comes from religion. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Um, and uh, if you, for instance, go back to uh, George Chauncey's world of the 1940s, you have these people called fairies, right? Um, and it is then, as the world, as the concept homosexuality becomes more common, they are homosexuals, and so are various other groups. And of course, we would place, as we are free to give other people identities, some of the normal in the field of homosexual, because we think any man who sleeps with another man is a homosexual, which is not what people at that time thought, but that's okay. The question is, so here we have all these different people who could, be, could identify themselves as homosexuals or could be called homosexuals. Are they a group? Who says they're a group? I just want to say one thing really quickly. So, um, um, consequently, ex-gay therapy is crazy because it's an attempt to change a person from something they are, whatever they are. Right? It doesn't matter how they fit into that category, homosexual. They still are what they are. And trying to change them will never work. The, 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 this is something that they do right now in, in Iran, but the, the part of the reason that they have people go to have this therapy is that they're, um, they're thought to be West toxicated. So it's not just that they're gay, but it's that they're suffering from what's called West toxication because being gay is a Western thing. But the irony, of course, is that um, as Afsan and Ajmabadi writes in her book, um, Women with Mustaches and Men Without Beards, um, there was a lot of same gender love and, and sexuality for, for you know, centuries. And then it was at the moment of the colonial encounter that um, you know, European and you know, people from the West said, what you're doing is bad. It's anti-modern. Um, and so no more of this same sex or same gender uh, love. We don't want this anymore. And so uh, they thought, OK, now we have to be more like them. And so we have to say no more same sex love or, or same sex, same gender love. Um, and then now, of course, they are trying to give therapy because it's too much like a Western thing. And of course, the United States now criticizes Iran for being anti-gay 
it's very confusing. So when you put culture into the pot, it gets even more confusing. Uh, thank you all very much. This was fascinating. <laughs> Hi, some of you um, addressed the fact that uh, categorizing home or sexuality in general is problematic and oversimplifying, and I definitely agree with that, but I was wondering if someone could speak to the role that it plays in, um, protect in legislation in order to protect human rights so that, uh, given the homophobic nature of the society that we live in. I mean, I could talk about when human rights go very wrong. I'd, I'd, I actually would want to tell you about a case of a young man who um, who was on, on trial in Iran, obviously, for, for being gay. What had actually happened was he had raped a 13-year-old uh, boy. Um, but the LGBT community jumped on it and said, Iran is anti-gay. You even had people in the, in the UK saying, we need to bomb Iran um, because I need to be able to come out of the closet. Um, this young man did not identify as gay because this, they don't have these signals necessarily in this town that he was coming from. Um, at one point, the judge had decided to let him go. Uh, but because there was so much LGBT activism around him being gay, him being gay, him being gay, he was executed the next day. Um, this happened with three men who are now dead because of the way in which it was politicized. So we have to be careful with the deployment of politicization um, across borders. I think that, in answer to your question, that in the United States, the identification of gay people as a distinct category in society has, on balance, been very beneficial in terms of how gay people are con conceived and how they're treated in society. If they weren't, I think it would be um, recognized as such. If they weren't recognized as such, I think uh, that we wouldn't have the kind of, um, you know, the, the amount of uh, legal protections, for example, that we, that we now do, even though they're, you know, much more limited than I think they should be. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I just have, a, I guess, a comment and then a really long question. Um, but in terms of um, David Halperin's idiotic assumption that um, nothing exists until you name it, I was wondering how you understood race and how that exists as an object. Um, but beyond that, the question I want to ask is, um, when you're talking about sex and homosexuality, what do you privilege as the like determiner of sex? Is it my genes or my gonads or my gametes? Um, and two, how do you, why is gender being privileged as the object of desire? Like, what about rice queens or snow queens or ginger queens? People who desire racially. And um, where does all this come from? And if I were to like find out that I somehow disagree with my desire. How could, could, do I have any, if I found that I, I disagree with how my desire was manufactured, how would I like, enact a change within it, or is that possible? There are so many interesting questions in there. Actually. Yeah, could yeah, you just pick one of them and say which one you want to ask? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. I guess um, in determining like, how we say that we're saying homosexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality, um, why are we privileging gender as yeah. the object of desire? That's and not, interesting. Like, I mean, uh, like, uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, it may be in part for the wrong reasons. That is, because because there's a, um, it's it, being gay is so transgressive. It has been so transgressive, transgressive that it becomes very salient, and so people think about it a lot. And so that category has been sort of paid attention to by scientists and so on. So in that sense, it, it's a not very good scientific reason for focusing on that particular aspect or dimension of sexual attraction, if you like. On the other hand, I think there's reason to think that sexual orientation might be a rather basic aspect of. Um, our sexuality, because after all, you know, reproduction does involve heterosexual mating, and the fact you have, at least on the face of it, a violation of that when you're talking about same-sex attraction, brings up the, the thought that there's something very significant going on there. It's, it's, it's something very profound, if you like. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, as trivial as you like, as, as if you if you want to mate, you know, you brought up rice queen versus non-rice queen or whatever. That seems like a second order thing. So scientists try to start with the basic stuff, treat all human beings as identical first off. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work for everything, divide them up to men and women. If that doesn't work, divide it up to gay and straight. Maybe then you have to be forced to divide them into butch versus femme or something like that. But scientists um, adhere to Occam's razor principle, you know, the idea that you try and keep it as simple as you can and not bring in ex other explanations and divisions unless you absolutely have to. Here's where social science deviates, because what we say is it's all complicated, yeah. right? Um, but I think that your question is a very good one, and I think that that is, I mean, 
mean, the, the, this was set up around a certain, you know, right, privileging right, of right, certain. Right, right. But I think it's a really important question. But I think, and I think that actually race plays a huge role in our discussions of sexuality, oh, and and certainly in the politics of it, and and in the privileging of reproduction, of you know, uh, of of the movement of bodies, of of intimacy, of the commodification of intimacy, and certainly gets back to sort of Marxist ideas about right. fetishization, etc. But I think it's a great question. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Hi. Um, I just had a question about the, the fact that was mentioned that male people, male people, m people who are men, whose whose sex and genders align in that traditional way, are more likely to identify on one end or the other of the sexuality spectrum than are females, and, and that we see more bisexually identifying females in recent studies. And um, I looked it up, and the Kinsey studies, which were conducted at the uh, end of the uh, beginning of the 50s, sort of, um, found that 11.6% of white males aged 20 to 35 uh, identified as threes, which were bisexual, more or less. And then, and then it says 7% uh, of uh, females in that, that group would have identified as such. And so I, as somebody with absolutely no statistical background whatsoever, I'm wondering if that difference is significant and why it will have flip-flopped now and why we see more females identifying as bisexual than males. Um, I, I, I think you're wrong, actually. Uh, I don't think he asked them how they identified. I think he, I, you're talking about how he assigned them on the Kinsey right, okay. scale, which is a totally different thing. He, he, his Kinsey scale was based on two, actually two things. If, he asked them about their sexual attractions, and he asked them about their sexual behavior. Now, most, people, most scientists today who study this look only at attraction and arousal, not at behavior, because they feel that behavior is a second order thing that's strongly influenced by social forces in a way that's, that's difficult to, to sort of analyze at a biological level. Um, if you look at it biologically, most directly, if you simply put it, like for men, put a blood pressure cuff around their penis and you show them erotic images of males or females, right, that in, with that kind of test, men fall very strongly into, into two groups. There's a lot of men who are only aroused by images of women, some are aroused only by images of, 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 of men, and a few, a very few, but some, who are equally aroused by images of either sex. Whereas in women, you have this m nothing like that at all. You have many women which are, who are erotically responsive in terms of their genital responses to images of, uh, of both sexes, regardless of how they identify. So there is that basic difference in the, in the spectrum, if you like. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to add that as somebody who finds pornography deeply repugnant, and, and I don't say that as you know as a prude. I really find it repugnant. I'm always very doubtful of those tests because I doubt they would work on me. Um, and I, I think uh, you know I don't usually talk about my private life, um, but I think that I'm probably not the only one uh, in this regard. Um, and my question about those tests is always: then does this mean that other society in other societies it would work in an entirely different way? And then what on earth could that possibly mean? I, I, I don't think it would work in a different way in different societies. You don't think it would? No. But there are societies in which it's taken for granted that men are attracted to boys, as in, for instance, Persia or in ancient Greece. Would they not have genital responses to whatever their version of pornography was in which boys were? Why wouldn't they? I'm not convinced that there are societies in which it's taken for granted that, there are, that, that men are attracted to adolescent boys. I mean, I think in any society, including our own, if you don't have access to your number one preference, then you go for your number two preference. That's but clear. That's what happens in prison, for example, and many other. I mean, so you're talking about situational, but I think that there's also a place, I mean, it's not just men being attracted to adolescent boys. It's, it's young men being attracted to other young men, you know, and in a place like Iran, where there's gender segregation from day one, right? Men and women, young young boys and girls, are separated from day one, right? And and and, and it's but it's not just situational, right? And, and it, yeah, can, it, can we it, say that in ancient Rome, men had uh, full access to any kind of sexual object they wanted, but the idea that boys were attractive was absolutely taken for granted. Well, everywhere in the culture, th 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 not th adult men, but boys. There are quite a few references in Roman, in Latin literature, to the distinction between being attracted to uh, males or females. Uh, I remember one that I read in John Boswell's book, where it's something um, where he, he quotes a, a reference of that kind of, uh, from some poet or other, where he's talking about the fact that some people are attracted to males and some people to, to females. So I just don't think it's true that uh, that in ancient times there wasn't this concept of, of no, opposite sex. No time to go into it, but I could fight, tell you the Roman sources a lot better than John Boswell knew them. 
And uh, it, that's a rare idea in Roman culture as well. And the, it is absolutely assumed in almost all Roman sources that boys are an equal object of attraction to women for the average man. On the other hand, people can exaggerate in their attractions. There are people who are accused of having an exaggerated attraction to boys or also having improper things like they have oral sex, which is just horrible. Um, or, uh, or also, certainly in Greek sources, an exaggerated attraction to women. So they, there is the idea that people can have a tendency, but at the same time, uh, the idea that women and boys always paired, mm -hmm. either a woman or a boy. So what would genital cuffs tell us? I mean, we're obviously not going to be able to make the experiment. We can't do the experiment now. Yeah. Could Sorry. I jump in for a second um, and simply say back to the original question? Um, I think it may be backwards the way you're presenting it, but it's clear that how you measure sexual orientation or sexuality gives you different results. But I think the bottom line is um, um, when Dr. LeVay brought it up in, in the very beginning, um, men and women's prof profiles are very different in that regard. Thank you. Uh, we have about five more minutes for questions. If we don't get to your question, uh, feel free to ask the speakers after the event is over. And I apologize in advance if we don't get to you. Okay, thank you. This question is for Dr. LeVay. Um, so this is kind of going back to the nature versus nurture, and I'm sure you get this question a hundred times, but uh, I'd imagine if I decided to take up piano and practice piano every day, that certain parts of my brain would develop differently and certain parts would grow larger uh, due to just practicing that behavior again and again. And how did you try to account for that when you say something like a bi biological predisposition, you're looking at prenatal hormones, you're looking at genes, those are things you're saying happen from the time you're born that later um, get realized. And I'm wondering, I mean, if, I, if you choose to be with men and continue to be with men, isn't it also possible that certain parts of your brain as an adult male would show different results? Yeah, th th that's a, a good point. The, um, it's absolutely true that if you do p practice piano long enough, um, you will expand the, the finger regions of the hand and so on. In fact, it's been shown, for, for example, cab drivers, the part of the, 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 the brain that's involved in, in navigation improves as a result of uh, lear learning to find their way around a city or something like that. So yes, the brain is a plastic organ. Now with regard to the hypothalamus, which is the part of the brain that I studied, um, the evidence mostly comes from animal studies where it's been shown that there's what's called a sensitive period or critical period development when you can influence the size of this region of the brain by changing the hormonal environment to which the brain is exposed during this critical period. And, after, and when you do that, you not only change the final size of this structure in the brain, you also change the animal's sexual behavior in terms of its partner preference when it's adult, right? You, if you do that after the end of the critical period, you don't change the size of these structures and you don't change the animal's preferred partners. So it's as if um, there's, a, there's a period of plasticity when the brain is first putting itself together when this is all you know, up for grabs, if you like. And there's a period later when you could play the piano, if you like, sexually, um, which w w where you would not, um, uh, you are not going to have these effects that you describe in this part of the brain. But it's, it's, a, it's a serious question, and of course, that depends on the argument that human development runs by the same rules as it does in animals, non-human animals. I tend to be, um, I tend to reject this sort of human exceptionalist idea, you know, that, that everything's different in humans and we have our own different set of developmental rules. I think the commonality between humans and non-human animals is so strong in many of these things like sexuality that we should be looking for common explanations and not special ones for us. Can I just ask one little backup question? Do we know when that critical period might be for humans, for that? Well, it would be, be, by analogy with the animal experiments, it would be well before birth, but, but the, um, the exact period is not really known. Thank you. You're good. Okay. So uh, I have two comments to make here. One of, well, two things to say here. One of them is more of a comment, and I'm just kind of looking to see what, you, what, what your response is. Um, and the second was actually a question. Um, about midway through the discussion, there was kind of a, uh, a discrepancy between sex and gender that was never adequately um, concluded. Like, based on my own um, research, my own work with an organization called like, Gay Alliance Network of Southern California, um, I've, I, I learned that gender has a concrete definition, or rather sex has a concrete definition. It is expanded as assigned sex at birth. And that is completely, as um, 
I'm sorry, I do not remember your name. Hardy um, Smadavi. Yes. Um, as you said, like, those are disconnected, and I agree with that completely because based on these definitions that I have of sex being a sign and then gender being a person's own understanding, like a person's own, um, yeah, a person's own understanding of their, of whether they identify as male or female or somewhere in between on that spectrum. Is that accurate or is there a little more to it than I've, uh, than I've just posited? Um, well, I guess I, I, I think, you know, I think as, as um, Professor Lear pointed out that, that genders, you know, it, it could be what you choose, but it could also be what's assigned to you based on what society understands the categories to be and, and what your performance signals. So it's also oftentimes about, about the signal too. So somebody who might dress a certain way or wear their hair a certain way might signal one thing in one place. But you know, if I wanted to signal female um, you know, in, in Iran, I'd have to wear hijab. Right. Um, if I wanted to signal male, it would, you know, it would be different. And and so I think there there's signals, there's performance, there's there's personal choice, personal preference, there's what um, society assigns to you. I, I guess that was kind of what I was, where I was going. And and it and it's not static. Uh, that gender is really not static. I think is the emphasis there. I I think we need to distinguish between gender identity right, and, um, and sex. Mm -hmm. um, people yeah, awesome. assign doctors assign sex based on on the presence or absence of certain things in your body. And often they're wrong, but they usually take their best guess. Um, and that's based on developmental biology. Gender identity is, I don't believe a choice. It's something that you feel. It's something that you recognize. I would challenge someone who is male born and identifies as male to prove your gender identity, to defend it without looking at your body. It's something that all of us innately know. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's not so clear, but it's something that we recognize about ourselves and what we do about it and what we decide to do about whether we're gay, straight, gender, queer, um, male, female, pick your continuum, pick your thing. Um, what you do about it is a choice, but um, how you identify and who you're attracted to is probably not. Okay. And then the second thing I have to talk, I wanted to ask here has to do with like, um, just really quickly, the, um, what is the relationship between um, sexuality and um, like sexual, like physical sexual acts versus a person's um, emotional relationship with someone else? Like could, for instance, could a woman be identi or could a woman identify herself as a lesbian by even if she has sex with men because she has emotional relationships with women? Or is it possible for someone who's bisexual or who identifies as, as bisexual to be attract physically attracted to men, emotionally attracted to women, or vice versa? Like, is that, where does that come in? I, th I think that absolutely happens. You have some bisexual people who are, are really torn in that sense between a physical attraction to one sex and an emotional sort of desire to bond with the other sex. And that, um, I, th I think that's not at all uncommon, actually. But maybe since um, we have only like a minute or so, we have two more people asking questions, maybe we should go on to them rather than um, continue with this. Although it's a really interesting question, I have to say. But let, let, let's let the other two have a question too, right? Because you've had one already. So everybody here. Um, hello, this is uh, actually just two, two things that I would like to bring up. First of them is a comment in, actually in reaction to something that you had said. I apologize for not remembering your name. Simon. Simon. Um, it seems slightly misleading to characterize the, the, the scientific view to be just like sim looking for what seems sim most simple as the explanation, because it seems to be, a, you seem to have a mischaracterization of what Occam's razor seems to do. Mm -hmm. The razor itself doesn't actually state simplest is that. It's don't multiply the options that are there unnecessarily. So it's, I, it's something that I just wanted to address with something you had said earlier. It seems incorrect the way you would categorize that style of thinking, firstly. And secondly, my, uh, another, com another comment, but also a question. Why, is it, why does it appear as though the, two, the models, the, the way you're choosing to approach each of your studies seems to be solely in a binaristic model? Because it seemed to be throughout the whole thing, both less so, I apologize again, not knowing uh, It seems to be mostly focused on a binaristic style of thinking, whereas Rachel and I knew Hardis. your names are Hardis. Hardis. 
seem to accept or at least be open to the more the idea of like alternatives or that there's outside ones or the ones that don't necessarily fall into that how would how would you say that that falls into your uh, what would you say in response to that because it seems as though much of your thinking is solely binaristic male female or just polar sort of polarized sort of thinking? Well, I think, you know, as I said, I think scientists try to keep things simple. Yeah, Occam's razor, razor is a little more complicated than I said. It's um, actually entia non sunt uh, multiplicanda praeta necessitatem or something like That's that, right? right? Wow. And, and, um, <laughs> which really has to do not with just totally keeping it simple. It's kind of what kind of models you're going to use and how many models and so forth. So it's, it's, it's more complicated. Uh, but, which is ironical. But the, um, the, the what was the other point? I'm sorry, I'm having a Rick Perry moment now. The no IQ scientists would deny that you have a Rick Perry moment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> scientists, tr basically, a, a very common scientific view which I have is that you do best to try and. Uh, 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 not to split things more than you, you you have to, and obviously in the end you do have to. But it's best at first to try and keep things as simple as you can. Otherwise, you tend not to make progress. You know, if you say, "Oh, it's so many different things," you know, how can you say, you know, you're equating a butch lesbian with a femme lesbian? You know, isn't that completely ridiculous? Because they're completely different animals. Well, yeah, they probably are, but. If you work on the assumption they're the same thing and you're dis distinguishing them from heterosexual women, you can make a certain amount of progress that way. And uh, eventually people get onto these more complex aspects, uh, these, these more subtle differences, and, and uh, that may be where the next generation of scientists will, will tackle that. Can I just so, say that if I was part of that, if the, that part was partly directed at me, I was discussing the social concepts of heterosexuality and homosexuality in no way implying that I agree. Oh, that the binary I, I so, <laughs> so yeah, we're we're all speaking a shorthand. Um, so what what I had said is, if you had people on a continuum, scientists will often look at the extremes to see if there's something there, with every intention of going back and picking up all the points and seeing what happens. My point is, they never do when it comes to sexuality. Well. Actually, this, uh, read, read my book, Rachel. There's this, um, th th there are uh, plenty of examples of people looking at more subtle distinctions in terms of uh, bisexuality, for example, and in butch femme. There are studies on finger length ratios comparing butch versus femme lesbians, for example, with very interesting results. So there is an effort to, 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 to uh, look at these finer distinctions. But I agree, it, it's, it's very, at a very early stage, and it's something that's mostly it, it, for the future. But I think that, and that's why in, in many c cultures, they just don't identify, <laughs> they, you know, cause, because it, it's, uh, it's so loaded to identify. You want to hear uh, can we hear the last one. question? Yes. Um, my question is, have you examined and what are your opinions about other abnormal sexual behaviors and desires, i.e. kinks, however you choose to define that? Who was the question directed at? <laughs> oh, have, have, but, I mean, have we examined them from what? I mean, I, just I, in your like in your fields and your research, your, as in particular, like, have you been exa Have you examined like other forms of sexual desire and behavior abnormalities um, that are not simply who you choose to do what with, but what you choose to do mm -hmm. with them? Yeah. or it yeah. in some circumstances. That's a great question. I mean, for, for example, you know, tops versus bottoms among gay men. You know, p p men who, pref you know, if you're engaging in anal intercourse, do you want to be the inserter or the insertee in the, in the, in the romantic terminology that's used? <laughs> and um, so uh, these are important questions, and they haven't really been looked at very much at all. They should be, but they haven't so far. They're looked at quite a bit, though, in, in anthropology and you know, <laughs> I mean, in gender studies, obviously. You know, Gail Rubin, if you were specifically asking about kink, you know, S&M, Leathers, Gail Rubin certainly, yeah. Judith Butler has certainly looked at this, right? I mean, there's been quite a lot on, on you know, beyond just who, but the what and the and the different and but but the, but it's not termed abnormal within well, anthropology, right? right. right. That's the quotes, right? I mean, it's, it, yeah. and there's a lot of there's a whole you know category of study of deviance, mm -hmm. right? And so there's lots yeah. of studies of that. Definitely. Another important dimension is you know age of the person you're attracted to. You know, pedophile, pedophile 
a febophile or a hebophile, you know, the, the ancient Greek sort of model, um, adultophile, if you want to call it, and even gerontophile. You know, so that there's, that's a whole dimension that's of sexual orientation, if you like, that is waiting to be studied from a biological perspective, let's say. There's some studies, but not much so far. Yeah, so I just, just want to add, oh, sorry. Yeah. I would say that the other thing is that it's way behind in terms of if you look at the implications um, politically or in terms of policy. I think homosexuality got out of the DSM in 84, in the DSM-3 or the DSM-4? 3, because we're on 4 going to 5, right? Okay, and now trans is the big issue in, well, one of them in the current or the someday it may appear DSM-5. But um, kink and other fetishes are way behind and still in the dark ages in terms of social attitudes towards them and um, pathologizing them, at least in Western societies. And just as the historian, I just want to add that the idea of people as having an individual sexual taste is also a modern phenomenon. And I consider it quite interesting in the light of identity politics. Uh, I guess a dindum question, which I probably shouldn't do, but uh, as far as um, like polygamous versus monogamous or serial monogamist or polyamory. Number, yeah, yeah, the numbers. <laughs> that, that, what do you guys think of numbers? <laughs> They're great. Yeah. As officials of Pomona here. College, we, di we uh, don't uh, approve. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> Not the student body, everyone for you, else. For you. <laughs> It's interesting that every study has been done asking men and women, heterosexual men and women, when men, when men and women, how many sex partners the other sex they have. The men always have say they have had more female sex partners than the women say they have had male sex partners. And that doesn't work out statistically. Um, so, yes. Back to the lying issue. But I think when you talk about something like polyamory, you're talking about bonding with more than one person simultaneously, which is a somewhat different issue. And is also, I think, socially um, still way in the dark ages in terms of accept acceptability, at least in our culture. Uh, uh, do you guys think that these fall on the, I'm sorry, uh, like the uh, biological or constructivist end of the spectrum? Like, do you have any idea as to whether they are like, uh, I'm okay, I'll go sit down. Sorry, uh, we will have an opportunity to talk to them after the event, so sorry. can follow up on this. Uh, one more round of applause for our speakers. There are snacks and drinks waiting in the lobby for anyone that does wish to discuss these issues further. Um, in the back, you can leave comments about tonight's event or leave, join our mailing list. The PSU's next event will be next Wednesday at 7 p.m. in Rose Hills Theater called Hashtag Revolution, Occupy Wall Street, Arab Spring, and social media. Thank you. Like you said with everything else, you get to start. People, you know, people are going to look back at this conversation in our science ten years from now and say, "What idiots we were!" But we right. Don't. Well, right. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. how science works. <laughs> we may mingle snacks. now. Yeah. Let's give me God just checking to see what important things are. Very, very. Just call. Thank you. Thank you.